So hello everyone and welcome to the first Saikai Mentorship Program event of the year. And if you're not a mentee or a mentor this year, also welcome to you. Um, we're interested in teaching you and letting you learn more about psychology today. Before we begin, I'd like to do a small land acknowledgement. So I'd like to honor the UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus. It's situated on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Hunkamanian speaking Musqueam peoples. While UBC recognizes its situation in their territories, what we colonially know as Vancouver is also shared with the Salem Tooth and Squamish peoples. We would like to acknowledge that this stolen land and unceded land are still ongoing disposition and displacement of Indigenous folks on Turtle Island. UBC Sai Kai would also like to honor that everyone is located in many places near and far and honor the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. I'd also like to welcome everyone to please search what land that they are on today. Um, so today's event, we'll start with a small presentation from our Sai Kai team, and then we'll go into a Q&A session with our five mentors who are in attendance. Um, so that's all for me today. Welcome to the event and thank you for attending. And I'll pass it on to Cypress and Sushmita now. Okay. Um, hi everyone, my name is Cypress. So Shushmita and I are going to be going through a brief presentation um, before we get to our Q&A with our panelists. Um, in this presentation, we'd like to introduce you to UBC SciKai, provide some insight about being a psych major, provide some suggestions for how to get involved with the UBC psychology community. And then finally, we're gonna be going over the mentorship program. So for this event, we're gonna be using Slido um, to keep track of any questions that you might have either about the presentation um, or questions that you might have for the panelists later. Um, so to get started, go ahead and either scan the QR code with your phone on the slide, um, or you can visit the Slido website on your browser and then input the code that you see on the right-hand side. So 044654. Um, and we'll just give you a couple seconds or so to get set up with that. Okay, um, so to go ahead and begin, we're just gonna give you a short introduction to SciKai um, and the development of our chapter at UBC. So SciKai is the International Honor Society in Psychology, founded for the purposes of encouraging, stimulating, maintaining excellence in scholarship and advancing the science of psychology. So there are two driving forces that motivated the creation of our chapter at UBC. The first was to create a special mode of recognition for students with distinguished academic careers in psychology or a closely related discipline. SciKai only accepts students with a GPA in the top 35% of our university, and we believe that achieving this high standard of excellence should be recognized and celebrated. So the second driving force was to complement the extracurricular opportunities and awards already available at the department, faculty, and university levels. More specifically, 100% of the funds we generate from membership dues are designated to fund undergraduate awards and undergraduate driven initiatives. So leading our chapter, um, we have co-presidents Feeds and Norika, uh, as well as Vice President Internal Jaskarn, Vice President External Katerina, and Vice President Marketing Victoria. Um, if you're interested in learning more about SciKai, we also have our socials listed at the bottom of the slide. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to just a brief description of psychology as a major. Um, contemporary psychology is an incredibly diverse field um, and it's generally accepted that there's five domains of psychology, including social, cognitive, clinical, biological, and developmental. And UBC offers a variety of classes under each of these domains. There are many career opportunities available to students graduating with a degree in psychology. And we've listed just a few of the many options on the slide. For example, if you're completing a degree in psychology, you might consider a career in education, law, counseling, or research in psych. If you're completing a degree in behavioral neuroscience, you might consider medicine, dentistry, um, or research in neuroscience. And if you're completing a degree in cognitive systems, you might consider a career in computer science, quality assurance, or business analytics. Okay. 
Um, for those of you who want to learn more about the psychology program at UBC, um, in the next few slides, we're just going to go over um, some of the programs within psychology, some of the most popular courses um, offered by the department, some opportunities for how to get involved um, with the psychology community, and then lastly, we're just going to go over the mentorship program. Okay, so this is a slide um, that kind of breaks down the different programs that are within psychology. Um, so a rough breakdown for the percentage of students in each program, about 63% of students are in the BA psychology program, 21% um, are in the BSc behavioral neuroscience program, 10% are in the BSc um, cognitive systems program, and about 5% in BA speech sciences. Um, so this slide basically goes over um, the BSc in neuroscience. So this is a new program um, and it's for incoming students of 2022 um, and it's called the BSc in neuroscience. Um, this program brings together the neuroscience research and teaching expertise of UBC psych, UBC zoology, and UBC cellular and physiological science. So this program will be replacing the BSc in behavioral neuroscience starting with the class of fall 2022. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about this program, uh, there's a QR code on the right hand side of the screen that you can scan for more information. Okay, um, so in this slide, um, we basically have a bunch of popular psychology courses um, that are offered at UBC. So if you're looking for some class suggestions, these might be a place to um, start. So the first uh, course is Psych 300A um, or Abnormal Psychology. And this is a class that explores the definition, history and scope of abnormal behavior with an emphasis on the psychological factors that control its origin, maintenance and modification. Psych 335 or Gambling and Decision-Making is a class that explores the psychology of gambling behavior with an emphasis on judgment and decision-making, the cognitive neuroscience of choice and clinical perspectives on disordered gambling. Psych 319, or Applied Developmental Psychology, is a class that'll teach you how to apply theories and research in developmental psychology to contemporary social issues such as daycare, child abuse, divorce, substance abuse, and sexuality. Psych 305, or Personality Psychology, is a class that explores theory and research on individual differences in motivation, emotion, and social behavior. Um, and our last suggestion is, is Psych 301 or Brain and Dysfunction. Um, and this is a class that will explore cognitive and behavioral impairments resulting from brain dysfunction with a particular focus on various interventions and approaches. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about these specific classes or other classes in psychology, there's a QR code on the right hand side of the screen that will bring you to the 2021 winter course list. Um, so that's it for my part of the presentation. I'm going to be passing it on to uh, Shishmita for the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Cyprus. Apart from academics, there's many other ways to get involved at UBC through psychology focus clubs. One of them includes the Psychology Students Association, which is a student-run organization that seeks to enhance the personal, professional, and academic success of arts and science undergraduate students who are interested in psychology. You can also be a part of our Psychi Club, the International Honor Society at UBC, which recognizes and celebrates academic and non-academic excellence. Another club is UBC's Cognitive Systems Society, which is a student-run organization supporting students in the COGS Hype program and those with an interest in the COGS-related fields, such as neuroscience, philosophy, linguistics, and artificial intelligence. Then there's also the UBC Neuroscience Club, which focuses on exploring the connection between neuroscience and other academic disciplines. The Mental Health Awareness Club is UBC's largest mental health promotion organization to raise awareness, promote, and support positive mental well-being and eliminate stigma towards mental illness and conversations around it. To get more information, you can check out the Facebook and Instagram pages for these clubs. If you're interested in pursuing research at UBC, there's many research labs you can get involved with. Some of the labs at UBC are the SOMA Lab, the Center for Gambling Research at UBC, Depression, Stress, and Anxiety Lab, the Cognitive Neuroscience Lab, the Social Health Lab, the Early Development Research Group, Culture and Morality Lab, and the Language Development Center. 
You can find more about these existing research centers and ways of getting involved by scanning the QR code on the top right corner of the slide. One interesting way to learn more about these labs at UBC, what research they're currently conducting and how to volunteer for such research centers is to listen to the UBC Psychi's podcast called The Labyrinth. The Labyrinth podcast aims to educate students about UBC's renowned research labs in psychology, neuroscience, and counseling departments. In each episode, the podcast interviews individuals directly involved in core projects run by the labs and invites them to not only speak their experiences working at the lab, but also how and when undergraduate students with various levels of experience can get involved. The Labyrinth is available on YouTube and Spotify, and you can stream the podcast by scanning the QR code on the top right corner of the slide. There's numerous other ways to gain experience and get involved within and outside the UBC community. Firstly, the Go Global program lets UBC students travel abroad to study, conduct research, or take courses overseas. This involves summer programs and exchange research opportunities that can provide versatile exposure to the psychology field. Next, the Work Loan program supports and subsidizes meaningful work experience on campus offering current UBC students the opportunity to develop their skills in a professional work environment. You can learn from a mentor, expand your professional network, gain work experience and skills through a part-time UBC job, all while still taking classes. Thirdly, UBC students from certain programs have the opportunity to participate in co-op throughout their degree and apply their classroom knowledge to a professional work setting through paid positions. Co-op helps undergraduates and graduate students gain enriched educational experiences through workplace learning in diverse organizations. Now let's get into the mentorship program and how it's going to work. This program is essentially mentee-centered, meaning that you get to decide how to carry this forward. This involves your communication with your mentor, whether you want to connect through email or Zoom calls. It's all up to you including the number of times you communicate, what topics you want to discuss and wish to know more about, and how much time are you willing to share. Along with this, you also have the option of staying anonymous by using a different name or email while communicating with your mentor. If you feel that your mentor isn't the right match for you, you can always request for a different mentor. If you wish to change your email or name than what you submitted in your form, please email psychi at psych.ubc.ca after this event to make the necessary changes. I will now pass it on to Jaita and Crystal to introduce the panel portion for today's event. Thank you, Shushmita and Cypress, for your informative session on psychology at UBC. We are now starting with the panel portion of the event. We will start with having the mentors introduce themselves, and then we will move on to the Q&A session of this event. I would first like to invite Iowa to introduce herself, and then we will have Tasha, Anna, Raha, and Nikolai introduce themselves. Hi, my name's Isla. I'm a third year psychology major in the Faculty of Arts. I have a minor in Law and Society. I'm originally from Boston, Massachusetts, but I've come out here for school and I've really enjoyed my time here. And I've worked through Massachusetts General Hospital um, with internships in the, in the Boston area. Um, hi, I'm Tasha. I am a fifth year psychology major and I will be graduating this spring. Um, I am born and raised in Vancouver and I'm currently just doing a lot of volunteering, um, working with mental health organizations. Hi, I'm Anna. I am a third year honors behavioral neuroscience student, and I'm currently conducting research at the SOMA lab, and my thesis is focused on neuroendocrinology. I'm hoping to pursue either medicine or maybe graduate studies in the future. Hi everyone, I'm Raha. I'm in my fifth year of the behavioral neuroscience program. I'm from Vancouver and I'm currently doing research at a lab with UBC um, 
psychiatry uh, at the Faculty of Medicine, and that research is on addiction and homelessness. I also work in other um, volunteer positions related to mental health, so those are some of my passions. Hi, uh, I'm Nikolai. Um, I'm from the US and I'm in cognitive systems. Uh, currently, I'm finishing up my capstone project for cognitive systems in the Gordon lab doing uh, neuronal tracing and uh, like fruit flies. Um, super fun. Uh, yeah, I like cogs and happy to be here. Once again, please use the code on this slide to access Slido and ask our mentors any questions that you may have. Okay, so let's start with the first question for tonight. I addressed this question to Isla, but all of the other panelists feel free to provide any answer. So Isla, would, do you think COVID still impacts research opportunities at UBC, such as having fewer RA positions in psychology labs? Hi, that's a great question. Um, I definitely felt the impact when I was in my second year, I'm a third year now, of COVID, of COVID affecting research positions at UBC. And even though there definitely are ramifications from that, I think that you can get involved in volunteer opportunities outside of UBC as well. And you can reach out to faculty of other universities and have advisors um, that are outside of UBC if it's been difficult for you to find positions here. Yeah, I would add that like, I think definitely currently it's much better than it was, but last year in particular, there were a lot of lab positions that were uh, closed off and PIs are really hesitant to bring more people into the lab. So th this year it seems much more open and like, I know there are a lot of labs, especially in biology and I'm not so sure about the BNS crowd, but uh, biology definitely has a lot of room opening up in their labs. Thank you so much for your answers. I'm sure that was insightful. Since we're on the topic of research labs, what is the time commitment for most of these research positions? What would you assume? This is open to any panelist out there. Um, when I started out, usually I was told about 10 hours a week for like just volunteer based. But if you plan to do something like work learn or even like NSERC, it's going to be maybe 20, maybe 40 hours. But it really depends on if you're planning to get paid for it or if you're just volunteering or doing your own research. Yeah, I, I think for uh, cognitive systems, we're expected to do nine hours a week. Uh, sort of minimum, or they say maximum, but that's that's a lie. So but we, we do like 12 plus, I think currently on, on busy weeks, I'll do 15 or 20 hours, but so, some weeks are busier than others too. So sort of something to keep in mind. Thank you so much for your answers. For our next question, Tasha, I hope you can answer this. Is the GPA requirement just upper your courses, just site courses, or what is the requisite? Uh, is this for labs or like for grad school? I think it's more pertaining to labs, but if you wanna answer in accordance to grad school, go ahead. Okay, um, for labs, personally, I for my lab, I don't think there was a requirement. Um, I currently work at the DOS lab, so that's the Depression, Anxiety, and Stress lab. Um, I think they're just looking more for people who are passionate about what they do and their work. Um, I know some labs do require having at least, I think, a 75% um, for your GPA, but if you can show them like that you're passionate about what they research and what they um, what they're looking for, then I'm sure they can make you know accommodations for that as well. Um, for grad school, uh, kind of similar, like they do care a lot about, you know, your GPA and everything, but also um, just what you do outside of um, academics as well. So all the volunteering that you do and all the um, just like the extracurriculars that you do and how you get involved in the community is also super important as well as your references. 
Thank you for that answer. That's really insightful. So another question that's been sent in, I think Anna or Raha, you guys can answer this. The question is, what are some of the challenges one might face doing a behavioral neuroscience BS, but they want to go to a clinical psychology field? That's a good question. And I've actually recently looked into it. I don't think that there's much challenge in applying to that grad program as a BSc student. I think that you're able to directly apply the same way that a Bachelor of Arts student would. Yeah, I think it really depends also on the courses you take, just in the sense of like how prepared you are for a clinical a psychology kind of course. Um, I mean, with behavioral neuroscience, we take a lot of really similar courses to a lot of psych students. Uh, I mean, it might change a bit with the new neuroscience major, depending on if you go into the more cellular stream versus the behavioral stream. But yeah, I do believe there's quite a bit of overlap and it shouldn't be too difficult. It's important also to check um, the requirements for grad programs, maybe like midway through your degree to make sure, for example, you're not missing a certain stats class or something else that a program might require um, just to get an earlier um, start. Yeah. Okay, that's great. So the next question is, what type of applicants is AMS peer support looking for? Do they require any prior experience? I'm assuming that question is directed for me, unless anyone else is with peer support. Um, that's a great yeah, question. Sure, sorry about that. No worries. So peer support, um, for those that don't know, it's a service or a, yeah, it's a service provided on campus that offers um, confidential one-on-one -on -one peer support for staff and students. So I've been a volunteer with them since September. Um, and pretty much what we do is we offer a safe space for people to come and um, talk about some of the things that are on their mind, and we often direct them to other resources on campus, like uh, UBC Counseling, a Student Recovery Center, other, those are so many resources on campus, so um, yeah, we liaison them to um, other ones, and in terms of the um, application, um, they're looking for passion, so you don't need to have a previous experience within um, like the mental health field. Um, that's uh, obviously a plus. I mean, before I applied, I was a crisis responder with Kids Help Phone for a year. So I think that was um, a boost to my application. But if you are passionate and you are someone who um, engages in active listening, empathy, um, you're able to um, demonstrate all of that, then they'd be happy to have you. And I definitely would recommend both applying to it and also reaching out to them if you ever feel like you need support. I think it's an under, underutilized service on campus. Okay, that's great. Thank um, you for your answer. Sorry. Um, so this next question is um, for Nikolai. Um, so what do you think are some places outside of research where um, someone might be able to volunteer that would give them experience related to cognitive science? Yeah, that's that, that's a really big like question for COGS. It, it's a really big faculty with a lot of different like avenues. So there are positions with computer science. So people uh, volunteering, working, doing co-ops in local startups or major companies. Um, there are linguistics labs where you can work with different language uh, speakers and work on a lot of different projects that completely go over my head because that's just, yeah, it's a lot. Um, there's also a philosophy stream too, right? So there's working with the philosophy department and developing ideas there. So I would say a lot of COGS is geared towards research. Um, however, there are a lot of opportunities with like especially local startups with computer science and integrating uh, parts of psychology with that. There's a lot of like use, user interface type work that uh, definitely a lot of COG students go into. So that would be my, my guess. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that. Um, the next question is for Tasha and Isla. Um, so what is the difference between a psych major and honor psychology? And also, what are the requirements to enroll for the honors program? 
Um, personally, I'm not in honor psychology, so I'm just in the regular um, studies. Um, I think with honor psychology, you have to do a thesis, I believe, is one of the requirements. Um, and then you have to defend that thesis. Um, so when I'm just in the regular psychology program, I don't have to do any of that. Um, but if I wanted to, there's always like directed studies or other opportunities I could to get that type of research. Yeah, so um, I'm in the honors behavioral neuroscience program, um, and it's pretty much identical to the psychology one. So I can probably answer a little bit about this. Um, so as for the requirements, pretty much if you Google UBC honors psychology, you'll find like the page that talks about it. Um, generally, I believe it's uh, like a 76% average in second year you need to get into it. And also like an 80% in two specific classes, like the stats courses. Um, and then pretty much what you do is third year, you do one project and then fourth year, you do a different project. So that's why it's a bit different from most honors programs. And um, essentially you write a thesis for each project. You don't have to necessarily defend it, but you do, probably, you do have to do a presentation. So like a poster or an oral presentation at a conference. Um, essentially the only extra work you have is you have this seminar class you have to go to. And um, like history of psychology is a class you have to take. So there's like a few extra little requirements and you do have to take 30 credits in a year, I believe. I think for psychology honors, it's a little more flexible. But yeah, I recommend you look at the UBC calendar for the honors program and also just look up the actual honors program online and then you'll see all of the information you need. Thank you. Um, so the next question is directed for Isla. Um, so what is some advice you might have in order to figure out which psychology specialization you want to do in the future? I think one of the most the best things about psychology at UBC and in general is that there's so much breadth of knowledge and so many different directions you can take with that. Personally, I recommend just taking a huge amount of psychology courses that are offered in UBC in different streams and finding things that actually interest you more than just like the general psychological knowledge. I'm personally very interested in neuroscience, um, but I find that a lot of people don't really like that stream as, as much. Social um, psychology is very common, um, but I would just do your research, um, take a bunch of courses, and those are all gonna count towards your major anyway. Thank you, and also, um, are there any courses that um, any of you might know that would give you a general idea about the fields that UBC offers? Psych 100, I guess would be the main one. They, they're gonna touch on most of the major fields in there. Um, beyond that, the baseline 300 level courses are really important. So like Psych 300 uh, for abnormal, which would be more like towards clinical uh, 309, which is cognitive. Um, there are a bunch of other ones that I didn't take, but th they give you a pretty like extensive deep dive into each individual course. So definitely check out the th those 300 level courses if you're interested from the 100 level material. Yeah. Like, uh, personally, I think I am also really interested in kind of the neuroscience aspect. Um, so 301 and 304, I believe, are some popular ones that people take. Um, I know 304 is like a year round course, so that could be cool if you're into that. Um, but yeah, things like that. Okay, thank you. And um... So what is the best way to begin volunteering to gain experience in psychology and build your resume? Um, personally, the way I got into it is I recommend in about like second year, but I guess whenever you have the chance, reach out to one of your profs that you really enjoyed their class and with like a personalized letter, not like a generic email, reach out to them and ask them about, you know, volunteer opportunities, maybe at their lab. And from then it kind of just spirals on like the, once you get your foot in the door and that kind of thing, a lot, you have a lot more opportunities for many more things. Like for example, after joining the lab, I saw there was like a sustainability um, team on the lab and I joined that and that gave me more opportunities for other things and so on and so forth. So I think just getting your foot in the door, maybe talk to a professor you like is the best way to do that. I would just add 
especially if you're currently in their class toward the end of the term, talking to them in person, like that's, it's way better than cold emailing someone that maybe they remembered you from taking a test. If you can go to an office hours once or twice, do well on the course. And at the end, just kind of ask if there are opportunities. It's a much higher percentage chance that you're going to get into that lab. Also, I just want to say like, if you aren't, um, in direct contact with someone whose research you're really, really interested in, don't be disheartened to put yourself out there. I think that's my biggest advice is to really just give it your all and just shoot your shot pretty much. Like I, I'm doing a directed studies right now. And before I got to my lab, I reached out to so many other ones and they didn't work out, but it was probably for the best because I love the work that I do now. But um, yeah, just like maybe also in that email demonstrate that you have done your research on their work. So maybe talk about what aspect of their work you're really interested in, a recent study that they worked on and stuff like that. Just really show that you're interested and they'll be attracted to it. Thank you so much for all your answers. And since we're on the topic of research and research positions, what areas of research do you think are growing the most at UBC as of now? Sorry, are growing the most? Yeah. All of them, I, I would say. I, I think they're all just kind of like, especially coming out of COVID, I think they're all kind of expanding like crazy. Um, the cellular neuroscience stuff, uh, at least the stuff, the lab that I'm in is expanding. There are three new labs in the department that just joined. Uh, like all the sensory systems type stuff are expanding. There are more faculties being involved. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's great. I guess like there are like more research positions available than. So another question is, do psychology labs tend to have space for research assistants who may have recently graduated from a BA or B BSc program? And does that mean they're more competitive then? Um. I'm not well okay if you some if you're asking from the perspective of somebody who's graduated and now they're going into maybe like a master's or a grad degree then yes of course <laughs> but if you're kind of just talking about somebody who isn't necessarily in one of those programs and they've just graduated I do believe I know one person in my lab who um she's not currently doing a program she's planning to do master's but she isn't right now and she's still kind of hanging around the lab and helping out with like maybe some more technical stuff so I do believe there are opportunities to do so but it's not as common um, yeah sorry tasha you go ahead are you sure you can go yeah. okay um yeah personally in my lab um there are actually a lot of people who have graduated and are um, actually still in the lab and they're just kind of working towards getting their masters or their um or whatever program they wanted to get into um and it's also like if you're in the lab and then you graduate um you can also stay in the lab for i guess as long as you want as well um so, and then there's lots of opportunities also to like move up in the lab so you can become like a study coordinator you can um be like the lab manager or something like that so it's not just for undergraduate students um there's definitely room for students who have graduated as long as um you're passionate about like the topic and stuff yeah, I just want to add that there are also if you feel like you can't do like a work learn or directed studies or you can't enter a program because you're graduated, there are um, programs in the summer that are offered. Um, the ones that I can think of are NSERC and also SSRP, Student Summer Research Program. So you can apply to those directly after graduation. So the summer after graduation and you can reach out to research coordinators that way. So yeah, also look into summer programs because those are really, and you can get funding maybe for those, which is great. Yeah. Thank you. So the next question is for Nicola. As a person not in COGS, but interested in machine learning and AI, how would you suggest building skills and knowledge in the field? Uh... It depends. So if you're interested in actually like developing like coding and things like that, you can always take the computer science courses. There's no real issue with it. There's a bit of a prereq chain to do some of it. Um, I know 
uh, ComSci 330, which is applied machine learning, has a much lower barrier to entry. Uh, th and that one's going to focus more on like just using, I think they use Keras. Uh, but with, with machine learning, there's a lot of material online. MIT has their entire first, second, and third year machine learning course that, like published online with all of the like uh, repositories and everything like that. So you can get all of it on GitHub. Um, yeah, I would just say like start as soon as you can. Uh, don't don't underestimate the like necessity of math. So you're probably going to want to take some linear algebra. Probably going to want to take some uh, upper level calculus, uh, preferably preferably differential equations. But yeah, it's you can take the courses. There's almost always room in them, uh, and people that are really interesting. So. Thank you. Um, so the next question, I know we've touched a little bit upon this question, but how do you get into a research lab if you don't have previous experience? Anyone can answer this. Ayla, maybe you want to? Yeah, again, just like we were saying before, if you have a professor who you've looked up maybe and you find their research interesting and you're taking their class or you've taken their class, you should definitely reach out to them with a personalized email talking about their research, talking about your interests and your experiences, and then get your foot in the door. And like Anna said, it really grows from there. I mean, yeah, just to add on personally, like the Soma Lab, um, I took a class with with Dr. Soma in second year, and I emailed him right after the class, as Nikolai also mentioned a bit, um, and that's how I got in. So I think this is a very common story for a lot of people. So yeah. Um, the next question is: How competitive are directed studies? Can someone in psychology do a neuroscience directed study, and vice versa, or integrate some concepts from them? Um, I don't know if anyone else has done a directed study. I, I'm doing one right now. Um, but the student in psychology would apply to the psychology directed studies. It wouldn't really, unless they want a science credit, it wouldn't really um, justify them applying to the neuroscience one. And um, they're kind of similar to just applying to a regular lab. You just need to reach out to a researcher and mention that you want them to supervise your directed studies a lot of the times this is a previous prof um but yeah again it's the same process you express your interest in life and from there you um, reach out to the psych department and you do a proposal for your directed study so you kind of have to plan the entire year when you're applying so you have to come up with a project um and set yourself um, the deadlines and kind of explain why um, this is an important study and why it would be beneficial to you and to the field. And um, it's not necessarily competitive, it's just important to be really organized and clear in your intention. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, what kind of jobs or work do you do as an undergrad research assistant, um, such as what are your roles like? Um, well, usually when you start out, uh, they kind of start you off by showing you the basics. Like, for example, they start me off with like how to pipette, like that kind of thing. Um, you know, they show you how to clean like that stuff. And then you just start off helping a supervisor usually. So, you know, you're, you don't have to worry about like not really knowing what you're doing because they're watching you the entire time. Um, and you're just helping somebody. And then slowly you kind of transition to actually doing your own thing still with usually a supervisor and so this is more for like wet lab work so I'm not 100% sure for like the psych labs if somebody wants to elaborate on that a little bit yeah so like for psych labs I would say um it's more kind of like uh working with the grad student who's doing her um PhD or his PhD um so it's like either working in the study with the participants, which is something that you can do, or when you're not working with the participants, um, it's mainly, I guess, just like literature searches or like administrative tasks um, in the lab. Um, until Up until like 
now a lot of people have been doing their shifts like online so it would just be like helping out the grad student with like looking through articles and things like that that they'll need um, and then specifically for my lab we also can help screen participants um, which is something i'm being trained for right now so it's screening them over the phone um, seeing if they are eligible for the study um, so yeah it's just things like that thank you so um the next question is for anna um, what part of neuroendocrinology have you found the most interesting? Um, that's a great question. Thank you, whoever that was. Um, well, personally, I mean, I think, first of all, I think it's really interesting to see kind of how um, more of the physiological, like hormonal, steroidal functions in our body interact with the brain. I think the coolest thing for me is because we do a lot of wet lab work. So a lot of kind of hands-on, like uh, moving around solutions, that kind of thing. I think what What's really cool is generally you can't really see these like molecules like the um, cortisol for example when you're like pipetting it when you're trying to do something with it but then when you finally get the results you can actually see like where there is whatever molecule you're looking for how much there is of it and it's super cool to kind of like feel like you can't actually see what you're doing but then eventually getting the results and I think that's something that's super cool with like any sort of more um, basic kind of like neuroendocrinology or physiological kind of lab work. Yeah, that's probably my favorite part. <laughs> Thank you. And um, the next question is, what are some recommended courses for going into a social work field? I, I only know this completely secondhand, but I know that uh, Abnormal and Psych 400, which is clinical psychology, they have a lot of uh, like feeding into the like social work. I've only done Abnormal, I haven't done clinical psych, but I've heard a lot of really good things and it's very comprehensive from what I've heard. Yeah, I'm currently in clinical psych right now and it definitely does prepare you for a uh, first career in social work. Um, my professor, had panelists kind of like this come in who spoke about their professions, um, either in counseling psychology, clinical psychology, or in social work. So you do get to hear about what you'd be doing on a day-to-day -day basis, even just through reading the textbook. There are descriptions of a daily, a daily's, a day's work and as a clinical psychologist, as a social worker, and as a counselor. Thank you. Um, so for the next question, um, maybe, everyone responds with um, this. Um, so the question is, what psych course and which professor would you recommend? Uh, personally, um, I really, really like Psych 301 with Jay Hosking. Um, that was like a really good neuroscience class. And I think he's part of the reason why I like the class so much, just because he's like a great lecturer and a great prof. Um, he doesn't do research. I think he just is like a sessional lecturer. So that's pretty unfortunate, but that was one of the classes that was definitely like the highlight of my undergraduate um, yeah, year. Yeah, you know, it's really funny because I was about to say the exact same course with the same professor. I think Jay Hoskins is just a fantastic prof. I have him with a, a on another course right now, Psych 371, which is a behavioral neuroscience course. But yeah, I definitely recommend him if you have any opportunity. I personally also really enjoyed uh, a course by Dr. Soma, of course, which is why I joined his lab, because it's super like neurosciencey, and I'm more of kind of interested in like the physiological kind of neuroscience aspect of uh, like psych neuroscience. So I think that was a really cool course. Um, I guess I'll go. I love the Jay Hosking support. He's the kindest person in the world. And he's also the supervisor for the Behavioral Neuroscience Program. Um, so I was thinking that I should mention David King. He's one of my favorite professors at UBC. And I took um, personality psych. It's psych 30, someone know, 305, <laughs> 305 maybe. Yeah. And he's incredible um another one that i really enjoyed was abnormal psychology i took it with bethany michelle and that course really solidified um my interest in mental health so it's kind of neat how the courses you take can really affect the work that you do so now i'm doing a bunch of work related to what i learned in that course which is really cool yeah 
Yeah. Um, so speaking of my clinical psych course right now, the professor, Sheila Woody, is absolutely incredible. She's super passionate. And um, Stan Floresco, he teaches uh, brain and behavior. He's awesome. He lectures so intensely and so passionately. It makes you actually interested in like hormones and stuff. Yeah, I, I took a 371 with Hosking. Um, yeah, it, it was good. But uh, I'm trying to think for psychology courses. I actually think the first psych course I took at UBC was uh, Psych 309 with uh, Grace Strong. And I don't know if she still teaches that course, but it was fantastic, like really well done. And then uh, the other one, I had Lynn Alden for abnormal psychology and she's a clinician and was absolutely like with like just hilarious she, she's like this little old woman and she just told these awesome stories about her like clinical practice it was just great yeah i really liked her class thank you um so the next question is for um anna and raha um so how do you think the change in the behavioral neuroscience program might impact the classes needed to graduate as well as the overall program. Um, that's a good question. In my year, I'm I started neuroscience program about three years ago, and they were also doing a transition um, that kind of affected the course codes and stuff like that. So I was within a transition, and I find that a lot of the times they are really. Um, accommodating. So I wouldn't be worried about um, kind of the discrepancies between the the two, I guess, specializations, if you're someone who's already in one and it's switching over. Um, and I've checked the calendar for neuroscience um, in 2022. And it's really similar to what I did as a, as a BNS student, they kind of just switched the course names around. And um, a lot of the courses that they're offering are still the same, but they've added a few extra ones. Um, so it's not like a huge drastic difference, I would say. I don't know if Anna wants to weigh in as well. Um, I do want to add on, maybe I was wrong about this, but I did think that you can't really switch over in the sense that like they're implementing the, for example, the second years, like the first year of the program for neuroscience, but they're not implementing all of the years at once. So like, for example, me as a fourth year student next year, I won't be able to switch to fourth year neuroscience because they'll only have the second year neuroscience class. And then they'll have the third year after that and then fourth year. So that shouldn't be an issue. But as uh, as Raha said, the classes are, a lot of the classes are pretty much just being renamed. Like they're the same exact class as we had to take for behavioral neuro. Um, and again, there is gonna be this thing with like cellular versus behavioral streams. So I guess it also depends on that, but um, it shouldn't be too much of a difference, I don't think. Yeah, I, I can chime in on the cellular stuff because I've taken the classes that they're adding to it. Um, so bio 371, 372, 459, and 460. Um, those are all like very, they're very much biology focused. It's going to be like physiology, things like that. So they're, uh, they're interesting, but they're a pretty firm departure from a lot of like BNS. It's like sensory systems, uh, ion channel, all that fun stuff. Thank you so much for your answers. So this next question is directed to Nikolai. What sort of careers are available as a cognitive science graduate? Uh, it, I would say, again, it's really dependent on the stream that you choose and also the co-op and work like opportunities that you're taking. So for a lot of the psychology stream uh, COG students, you're, a lot of them will go into uh, either like consulting uh, for computer science, like uh, software engineering companies, that's a really big, big push for a lot of people, uh, or software engineering generally. And then there's also just user interface. Uh, there a lot of there's a lot of overlap with uh, like corporate psychology departments um, and studying like how to implement different things. Uh, a lot of research opportunities, and then if you look at the other streams, uh, there's obviously software and AI for uh, the comm sci stream, and that's sort of what it's built around. And then linguistics and philosophy is going to be much more academic. Oh, uh, I should also say that there's quite a bit of like business overlap too. There are quite a few students in COGS who do the master's in management program and go down the business route with a lot of consulting work. 
Thank you so much for that. Um, so this next question is open to anyone. Um, have any of y'all been in the Go Global program or know anyone who has been? If yes, how was the application process? Is it competitive? Um, I was supposed to do a go, go global thing in Sydney, Australia, but because of COVID, it got canceled. So I didn't actually get to go. Um, but the process was pretty simple. Um, it was basically just like an application. And I think for most, you get to choose um, three of your top schools that you want to go to. Um, and I think your average, at least in psychology, has to be at least 75. Um, I wouldn't say it's like super competitive. Um, I wouldn't know exactly how it works, but um, usually people get at least like one of their schools that they choose. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that some, I didn't go on Go Global either because of COVID, but I think that some schools can be a little bit more competitive, like schools um, in the UK seem to be a little bit more competitive than others, but with three options, you're bound to get one of them you know, normally. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. So this next question is, any tips for balancing a full course load and a 10 R plus um, 10 hour plus week research assist, assistant job. Um, one thing I just want to say before answering that is that learn where to stop. Because <laughs> again, as I, as I said, once you get your foot in the door, it's so much easier to get more and more. At some point you realize that it could be too much. So yeah, like, F figure out what works for you some people you know are more flexible with their time some people are not um and that's okay i mean for me personally the the great thing about labs at least from for my lab is the 10 hours a week is very flexible sometimes i might not come in at all for a week or two sometimes it might be more like 15 hours a week sometimes i'll come in on the weekend if i can't do it during the week so that's a really nice thing it's quite flexible um Otherwise, you know, just kind of learn how to plan and, you know, time management, all of that stuff. Adopt a schedule and I use Apple Calendar and it's very important. Yeah, get a lot of sleep, be healthy. <laughs> yeah, I really want to echo Anna and Nikolai's comments to really prioritize self-care um, just because even in this conversation, it seems like we're talking about all these opportunities and there's so much to be done and it's all so exciting, but it's also really possible to go through burnout. So, and then in that case, you're kind of left kind of unable to do anything because you're feeling pretty bad. So make sure that you're prioritizing everything and, um, sorry, prioritizing your health before anything. And my tip is to start things earlier than later. I think time management something you kind of learn as you go through university first year is kind of like ah, pretty intense but then you learn to um adopt whatever practices work best for you for me it's starting projects early i also um have an, an agenda that i use religiously and it's nice to cross things out um so yeah i would recommend agendas and early starts i would also add talking to your pi especially like if you have things coming up like midterm week or something like that, or the week leading up to midterms. And most of the time they're gonna be pretty flexible. Like, unless they're more on the rude side. Uh, I mean, my PI just kind of is like, all right, have fun. Like, you know, take care of your flies, but you know, just go do what you need to do and come back when you can. So there's there's quite a bit of wiggle room. They're, they're, you're not a slave and they shouldn't be expecting you to be one, so. Thank you so much for all these great tips. So the next question is that, is it true that psychology students are more friendly and empathetic? What would you say the community is like? Well, COG students are obviously better. Everyone's nice. Does anyone have anything to add to that? 
Um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> being in, I don't think uh, being in psychology makes anybody inherently more empathetic, but I, it is interesting. You do learn a lot about the, how the brain works and kind of that kind of thing. And I feel like in some cases it may help people be more understanding, I guess, what people could be going through or like from other people's perspective. But um, don't, don't expect that psych students are going to be like super nice or super mean or anything like that. <laughs> Yeah, and psychology is a huge major at UBC. I think it's the biggest major. And so within that, there are a lot of different types of people. I think that there's a pretty strong community for psychology if you want to get involved in it. But that's not to say that everyone is involved in it or that everyone is the best person ever. Um, but with learning, um, obviously, you can become more empathetic. I hope that psychology helps us all to do that. Thank you so much for that. So the next question is, I've heard that the average age of graduate program applicants is, is quite higher than 22 years of age. Do many people take their time off? What do people do during this time after undergraduation and then going to grad school? Um, so I'm currently, like I finished all my classes in December, so I'm currently doing a gap year um, because I want to apply for my master's in 2023. Um, so I decided to take a year off just because I felt like I need to get more experience in what I wanted to do. So um, right now I'm just like working. I'm doing research in my lab. I'm hoping to do like a directed studies, but I'm also volunteering for like a bunch of mental health organizations that I'm really passionate about. So finding, I guess, kind of like a niche of what you really want to do. Um, and personally, like working with kids and working with youth, which I am currently doing is something that really helped me figure out that that's the age range I want to work with um, in the future. So I think it's really like I would highly recommend like if you're not ready to do a master's um, like right after your undergraduate degree because that's like you know it's a lot of school like going straight back into it like to take that gap year to find out exactly um, what it is that you want to do and like in what capacity that you want to do it. Yeah I definitely agree and especially if you're looking to go into um, like the PhD realm that's going to take six to eight years possibly which is a huge, huge time commitment. And it's incredibly competitive to get into PhD programs for clinical psychology. So the fact that a lot of applicants are a couple years older means that they have a lot more experience when they're applying. You go out, you get experience, you do work through other universities, through UBC, whatever, and then you apply with a stronger resume or beta. Um, so you have to be aware of that when you're gonna apply to um, PhD programs and master's programs that your competition is going to be proportionally a little bit more um, advantage with their resume. Yeah, I, I would add on that. Like, I think it's definitely different on which graduate programs you're looking into. Uh, I know for clinical psychology, MD routes, you're looking at like a lot of people take those one or two years to really build themselves and also just kind of figure out if they really want to do it. Because clinical psych is, it's, it's the same length of time as becoming a psychiatrist and it's just as competitive. So, you know, there's definitely a lot of, uh, a lot of kind of like gearing up for it. Master's programs uh, can be pretty quick. People can go straight in after call, uh, after university and go right into a program. You can also do like a non-clinical like PhD in three or four years if you're really dedicated. So there's a lot of like, difference between grad programs. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, how do you recover from a bad semester GPA wise? And how much would you say it impacts post graduation options? You know, that's actually a really good question. I think uh, for a while, I was actually wondering about that too. I was like, what if I, you know, flunk a semester? What does that mean? Especially if like you're considering something like med school, you know, a lot of people go and try to go immediately after um, graduating. They're freaking out about it. Um, one thing to think is, I think about is that you, if you take a year or two even off and do, you know, more research, do more work, get more experience, they're gonna, your grades are gonna matter less and less. Like the more time you put to actually get the experience in the research and the more these programs are going to look at that recent research and experience you had so you know try your best but it's not end all be all you might have to take a little bit longer but for a lot of people that works out in the end 
Yeah, I, I would add uh, also something that I don't think a lot of people think about is the trends of like what your GPA is doing. So an upward trend versus like a downward trend. And if you like, let's say tank first year and then, you know, second year you get like a good, like, let's say like 70 average and you work your way up to getting like in those A and A plus ranges by your senior year, you're going to look a lot. It's going to look not as bad because it's going to look like someone just kind of figured it out. And so like, I know for uh, my PI, I had, I had talked to this, him about this a little bit. And when it comes to accepting PhD students and he almost looks at them as not better, but the same, it's the same as someone who's gotten A's all throughout if you're finishing strong, because to him, it's like, well, clearly you knew the information at the end and you know, you figured it out. So no big deal. And so some people like, I know one PhD student in his lab came in with uh, a three, one GPA, which would be, I think like the equivalent of like seventies around there, like mid seventies, but she had finished her like program with all A pluses. So it's definitely how you recover and just progressing and getting better every term. Thank you. I'm sure that must be a relief to hear. Um, so how is the TA experience and do you have any tips for getting in the TA application? Uh, I don't know if did anyone else TA. Okay, <laughs> um, I TA'd Psych 367. Uh, and so I finished the course uh, and reached out to Debbie, uh, Professor Joski right away. Um, and it, sometimes they have an opening and a lot of the times it's it, they'll take an undergrad TA if they don't have a, a grad student to teach the course. So um, my situation was kind of nice in the sense that I got lucky where it was a year they didn't have grad students. So they just brought me on because I'd done well in the course. Um, for the first year uh, classes, there's a lot more TA positions, I know. And it's kind of just do well in the courses and then try to get a reference from the professor. Like for me, I had to have Debbie uh, actually sign off saying like, I want this person on my course. And then I got assigned to her, so. Thank you for that. Um, so next question is, if any of you have studied psychology or related programs elsewhere, is your experience at UBC special? And do you think there's any advantages of UBC? It's UBC, what's not to love? It's beautiful here. Yeah, I haven't studied elsewhere, but I have a lot of friends who study in the States um, at smaller universities. And I think that one of the best things about UBC is how big the psychology department is and how research focused it is. So you can get involved, even though it can be competitive at times, you can really get involved and immerse yourself in research, which prepares you pretty well for graduate school and applications and all of that. Thank you. Um so the next question is, during labs, um, do you often work with other departments? If so, how does the collaboration between the departments work? Well, I'm not certain about departments, but we most definitely work with other labs. I know the majority of grad students in my lab have multiple projects going on at once where they're like second, third authors and other papers that they're just helping with. Because a lot of times, um, like a researcher might need some sort of proceed, well, something done that another lab does a lot of, uh, does a lot of. So it just saves time if they kind of help each other out that way. Between departments, I'm not sure if, does anybody else have anything to say about that? Yeah, I think it's probably more common in life sciences. Uh, specifically biology, because there's a lot of like biochemistry, for example, that a biology lab just doesn't have the tools to do. So they'll reach out to the biochemistry department or the CAPS uh, cellular and anatomical, whatever that stands for, uh, CAPS department. Um, so I think that's probably a bit more common there. And there, there's definitely quite a bit of overlap with like molecular biology, biology and biochemistry, and they'll work together, but they're all in the same building. So 
Thank you. Um, so if anyone knows, um, do graduate programs look at the last two years or cumulative or only side courses? Uh, I'm currently researching a whole bunch of grad programs that I want to go into. Um, I'm not exactly sure for some of them. I know um, the one I'm looking at really strongly right now is the U of T counseling program. Um, so I know that one, it said it only looks at your final year, um, which is really nice coming from someone who did pretty terribly in first and second year. Um, you know, I got it after in like third and fourth year. So it's kind of nice. I think most Canadian programs do only look at your upper level courses in your upper years, which is kind of a relief. Um, I have been looking into like some in the States. I think for those, they do take, you know, the cumulative of all your um, courses. Um, but once again, like if you have the experience, if you have more like volunteering and stuff on your plate, um, like Anna said before, it does get, the grades do get less and less important. And people just like want to see that you're passionate about, you know, what you want to study. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think in the States, uh, it's a lot more focused on cumulative GPA, um, although they might look specifically at your psychology courses, that cumulative GPA as well. But it's important to remember, especially if you're applying, I'm not sure about if you apply to schools in Canada. I'm not looking at that as much, but you have to take the GREs for a lot of schools in the States. And with that standardized test score, that can put you up above your grades too. Like if you do very well on the, G on the GREs and then you're not quite as high on your average cumulative GPA, that will still distinguish you. Thank you for that. So this next question is, how did you know you were interested in psychology or behavioral neuroscience or cogs? I can go first, I guess, uh, keep it from being odd. Um, so I actually started out being interested in psychology. I liked it in high school. Um, so I came here and I thought that might be a fun thing to go down. And then I actually took uh, Psych 309 uh, in my first term here, kind of like weirdly, but um, that was really fun. So that was cognitive uh, psychology. And then that got me interested in cognitive systems, which I took as my in my second term. And that kind of wrote me into that degree pathway. And then it's sort of just been an ongoing evolution, like especially the 300 level courses, it molded my like opinion, a lot of the stream I wanted to go into. So yeah, you, you just find what you like. And the more depth you go into, the more like you'll realize like, this is really not for me or yeah, this is great. Like I want to keep going. Like this is fantastic. And yeah. Um. I'll chime in as well. I think for me, I going into my degree, I was really passionate about science and I was also really torn on choosing humanities. So I think psychology, I would say is like, and I guess neuroscience is like a good in-between. So like in my degree, I, I also loved things like biology and chemistry. So you do take a lot of those courses, but you also take ones that are more like neuroscience focused and you're able to take things like, I take a lot of random literature courses. I've taken so many languages at UBC and it's really just like, a flexibility and you're able to dip your toes in different fields rather than be like categorized into one for example if you're a chemistry major you're really just doing chemistry but i like how diverse your course load can be um so if that's something that interests you you're in the right place <laughs> yeah honestly um when i got into ubc i was wasn't thinking about what I really wanted to do and psychology was the program that um, I just chose. So um, throughout like first and second year, I was still kind of deciding whether I wanted to switch out or whether I wanted to do something else. Um, but I think because um, until you get into third year where you are like at least those upper level courses, there's so many different options that you can take like social psych development and like clinical. Um, it wasn't until I think like third year that I really knew that I like really liked all the programs and um, specifically for psych, like almost all the profs I've had for all my classes are amazing. Like um, 
there's not one of them that I like really did not like. So I think that's also like a huge bonus, especially for like the psych program at UBC, especially if you like all your profs and you know that they're like all really great. Um, but just being able to have like study in such a broad field and being being able to like have those different types of classes and trying to find out exactly what it is that you like, but being able to work towards your degree as well um, is really cool. And then you kind of figure out what it is you exactly want to work on because you kind of got like a feel for everything. Um, I think for me, my story is pretty similar to Raha where I kind of, I, I was always really interested in sciences and I really wanted to pursue a, like a science degree. But I've always been kind of curious about psychology. I feel like I missed out. I wanted to do AP psych in high school, but didn't get the chance to. So I never took a psych class and I want to try that out too. So it was kind of a good combination of the two, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, it was pretty simple. I took AP psych in high school and I loved it. And I was like, let's go into this. Um, I really liked psychology and statistics. And when you're in research, you get a lot of both of those. So it really just merged my two favorite interests from high school. Thank you so much for all of your stories. Um, so this next question, question is directed towards Raha and Anna. Do you recommend doing honors or doing a directed studies program? Well, obviously I recommend honors. No, but it really depends on who it is, like on the person. I feel like if you want less commitment and you want that like research experience then definitely go for a directed studies. An honors program is if you really want to get kind of involved in like full on research, you get to write a full thesis, like a year long research program, right? And you get to do that twice. But with the directed studies, it's like a really great way to get like one semester's worth maybe of like doing some research and you get credits for it. So maybe Raha can talk a little more about that. But I think for honors, you really have to have the drive and the commitment to like do two years of research like that. Yeah, I would definitely second Anna's comment. I think doing an honors program, is much more dedication. Um, directed studies is kind of a similar concept. I explained that you come up with your own project and you do have to write like a thesis at the end of the course. Um, you can take a full year of directed studies. That's what I'm doing. So you get six science credits, which is awesome, but it's not for your entire degree. I think actually, well, it could be. I mean, it could be for two years. You can do a maximum of 12 credits, I believe, of directed studies. So you can kind of make your own honors. <laughs> but um, no, I think it's great and it's, um a good way to kind of um get involved with research and also get credits at the same time whereas an honors is definitely more immersive and a bit more commitment i would say yeah just to mention the one thing i forgot to say the big difference really is that honors is kind of like the like the program is an honors program like that's what it's called while directed studies is like a class or multiple classes you can take thank you so much for that um, okay, so we're on our last question for the night. Thank you all for all of your answers. So this last question is open to all of y'all. Uh, any recommendations or tips when choosing your timetable? What times are the best and what are the best number of courses to take in a semester? Personally, do not take 8 a.m. classes ever. Um, the way I do it right now, which works really well for me, not for everybody, is I have like full classes Tuesday, Thursdays, and I have my chem lab on uh, Wednesdays, but that's it. I don't have classes any other days. And that leaves me a lot of time to maybe go and do a day of like lab work or just do a day of studying. I think it's really great if you can have a few days without any coursework, if you can make it happen and no like super early classes also. Yeah, I agree. I hate 8 a.m.s. I love 9 a.m.s. They get your day started early, but not so early that you're yanking yourself out of bed before the sun rises. And I like to consolidate my courses early in the day because then I feel like done with my school day on to the rest of my homework day at around noon to two, ideally. I guess I can go. Um, yeah, I... 8 a.m.s are kind of brutal. You definitely have to reset your schedule. I think the hardest part is like if you kind of want to maintain, like if your friend group isn't on that same schedule, it gets really hard to balance. Like I think every year I've had an 8 a.m. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and it's just been brutal, but I've had to. 
Um, but like, it's entirely doable. I, yeah, I would just say like, I like to clump classes together. So I like to do two classes at most together. And then on Tuesday, Thursday, try to, I try to avoid getting into that three or four classes back to back to back. Cause I've done that a few times. And like by the last two classes, I'm just fried and I can't think. So yeah, just kind of know your limits. I would say is your big thing is like, see what works and keep with it. It's also prof dependent. Like if you have a great prof for like a certain class, don't just not take his class because, you know, it might be a little annoying with your timetable. Like if, if there's a perfect prof at 8 a.m., like maybe just take it anyway. Yeah, I, I would agree with both of them. I would say just be honest with yourself. Um, I'm not a morning person, so I could never do it in a.m., but that's just because I know me. Um, and I'm also doing the exact same thing as Anna. I have a four-day weekend and I get to go into the hospital on Fridays and do research and on Mondays I do a different volunteer um and I also would recommend like Nikolai said to not chunk all your classes back together make sure you're leaving time for like meal times and like time for your brain to rest because lectures can be exhausting and they're really um demanding so be honest with yourself and your own needs and just try to make it as easy for yourself as you can um yeah yeah, just like what everyone said. Um, honestly, 8 a.m.s, like I'm also not a morning person. So like it's terrible to get up. And I also commuted my um, entire undergrad for um, from like East Van. So it's like around an hour. Um, like theoretically, I think when I make my timetable, I'm like, oh, like it won't be that bad. It's fine. Um, but it sometimes does end up being like that bad. Um, so yeah, just like, I guess, knowing yourself and like knowing what you can handle, um, especially like at 8am, sometimes like you can't think because you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so tired. Um, but yeah, I really like having like either all my classes like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or like preferably Tuesday, Thursday, so that I can get that like four day weekend. Um, but if it's not possible, I think I usually do like an early class on let's say like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then have the rest on Tuesday, Thursday. So then um, there's still time to do like other stuff. Cause if you wanna do like volunteering or like extracurriculars or even just like hanging out or something, um, it's nice not to have classes like, um, you know, in the middle of your day, if you only have like one class um, also, would not recommend doing like late night classes, um, but that's just me. Um, just cause like, again, the commute and stuff, I did do like a, I think it was like a five to eight, three hour class. Um, it's like once a week. Uh, it, was, it wasn't like bad. I really liked the content, but it is definitely like a super, super long thing. And then you get like a 10 minute break in between, but it's like by the end of it, you can tell that everyone in the lecture hall is like, okay, like let's just leave. So it's really up to you, but yeah. Something you can look into are alertness cycles, like measuring your like diurnal rhythm and things like that. It sounds hocus pocus. It's it works. Like I cannot think from like three to seven p.m. Just period. Like when it comes to like critically thinking in lectures. So like I try to clump everything in that like nine a.m. to like two p.m. range. That's great. It was really nice looking into all of your perspectives and timetables. So this wraps up our Q&A session. I would like to thank all of our panelists for all the great tips and advice they've given. I'm sure it must be really helpful for all of the people we've had on tonight for our event. Thank you so much. And now I would like to hand it over to Just Learn for the ending. Thank you, Jai Dong. So thank you to all of our panelists. You guys did a great job of answering all the questions today. Um, you're free to leave now if you would like. Um, we really appreciate your time today. Um, just for the next couple of minutes, we're just going to go over some new events that are upcoming events by SciKai. So February 18th, in two days, we have an expert talk with a recent graduate, Ahmed Shaban. Um, so he's a graduated from UBC with the BSc in Cognitive Systems. And he's recently started his career in consulting at Avend as a software engineer. Um, information on how to access this event is available on our um, SciKai Instagram and Facebook. Sorry, went the wrong way. Um, as well, we do have uh, more events on our, all of our socials. Um, 
It's a Sakai Insider where we interview professors or professionals in the psychology field and then film minutes and then our YouTube. Um, as well, I'd like to say that there are some questions that came up today that we weren't able to answer due to time. Um, so we'll try our best to provide you with answers to those. We'll be circulating a document with all of the responses from today. Um, and then one of the questions were direct, was directed towards Saikai. So this question was, what would be the GPA requirement for Saikai membership? Um, so for that question, um, it kind of varies every year and year. As we mentioned, it's about 75%. In the past, it's been about 80% as your overall GP and also in your site courses. Um, I'll be adding a link into the chat where you can find more information about the Saikai membership. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can reach out to us at Saikai or um, the email through which the link for this website was sent to you. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for your time today. And we hope that you had a great time, you learned something and yeah, we'll be in touch with this slide deck and also all the questions that were asked today in the next few days.